Welcome to Studio One. Glad to have you along as we join you from our studio located on the campus of the University of North Dakota. I'm your host, Tom Buring. Up ahead this half hour, we'll talk about the fickle trade of place kicking with former Minnesota Viking Pat Beattie. Also, Eastern European historian Duncan Perry will discuss his recent trip to Bulgaria where discussions about higher education took place. And in our Open Door segment, part two in our visit with international journalist and former chairman of Time Life Broadcast, Richard Clerman. But first, let's go to the news desk with Chris Blaine. Chris? Thank you, Tom. UND's enrollment passed the 12,000 mark this semester, causing overcrowding all over the campus. But Ann Carrion reports one of the most crowded colleges is learning to cope. As the number of students in the University of North Dakota's aerospace program increases, both students and faculty will have to adjust. Bob Shoemaker, Associate Dean of the Center for Aerospace Sciences, says he has a handle on the situation. So we've increased the entrance requirements somewhat, and that's uh, going, to ha going to have some uh, constraining effect. But uh, you no, know, we're trying to size our capacity with, with the students that we bring on board. Shoemaker feels the higher requirements will bring more quality students into the program. The fall of 89 class members had to have a 2.5 grade point average compared to 2.0 for the class of 88. Flight instructors say the higher requirements will help, but more instructors are still needed. Yeah, they'll need more instructors, I think, if they, if they you know, increase the permanent flight schedule and more people start flying. We'll definitely need more instructors. Another concern is whether the university will have enough planes for all the students. Well, we're slowly replacing our fleet. Uh, we're doing it over about a two and a half year period. We now, uh, after about a year and a half, we replace about 50 of our aircraft. We still have, next August, we'll replace the rest of the fleet, the Cessna 152s, uh, the 172RGs. Uh, we'll be replacing them with Piper aircraft. So next August, we should have most of the airplanes replaced. As the number of students increases in the University of North Dakota's aviation program, so does its facilities. As one of the most modern facilities in the United States today, UND's aviation program will be successful for years to come. I'm Ann Kirian for Studio One News. Where the Meadowlark Sings is getting its world premiere on October 17th, the play is another North Dakota Centennial Commission play written by English professor Bill Borden. Meadowlark deals with three groups of people at the 1889 State Convention at Bismarck. The cast of 20 develops a show that uses historical fact, humor, and romance to illustrate the North Dakota birth as a state. The UND hockey team is looking forward to another winning season. The team hits the ice this weekend taking on Alabama Huntsville in its season home opener. With 19 returning lettermen, the team has both depth and experience. Returning to the team are senior center team captain and last year's leading scorer Lee Davidson, along with senior defenseman All-WCHA second team player Russ Parent and senior wing standout Brent Bobick. Coach Gino Gasparini expects his toughest challenge to come from rival Minnesota Gophers and Northern Michigan. He says he's looking forward to an exciting season, an improved team, and a tight league race. That's a look at today's news. I'm Chris Blaine reporting for Studio One. Tom? Okay, thank you, Chris. Be nice to have a good year of hockey. Tonight, the Statler Brothers, recently awarded Group of the Year for the sixth straight year by the Music City News Country Awards, will be performing at the Chester Fritz Auditorium for two shows. The 7 p.m. show is nearly sold out, but there are plenty of seats available for the 945 show. For more ticket information, contact the Chester Fritz Auditorium. Now look at what's happening in today's weather. Let's take a look at it with Studio One meteorologist Jay Searles. Jay? Thank you, Tom. After a gloomy and chilly start this morning, things have really turned out to be a beautiful Indian summer day. In the Almanac, we had a high yesterday of 62 degrees. This morning's low was a mild 44 degrees, and we've had no precipitation in the past 24 hours. Currently at 4 in the Grand Forks area, mo under mostly sunny skies, we have a temperature of 66 degrees, winds are west at 10 miles per hour, and the relative humidity is 38%. Taking a look at the nation, we had a ho nation's high yesterday was 100 degrees down here in Phoenix, Arizona. This morning's low was a chilly 28 at Eagles, Colorado. This cold front moving in off the west northwestern Pacific is bringing with it a few showers and some light rain to the Washington area. Otherwise, high pressure dominates through much of the Rockies, except for some cold coastal fog in the San Francisco area. In through the east, high pressure also dominates, except for this frontal boundary over the southeast into Florida. There they are experiencing some showers and thunder showers this afternoon. This frontal system in through the north or into the central U.S. is not causing any major problems, just some fog through the central Mississippi Valley this morning. Otherwise, clear skies dominate through much of this upper northwest as high, strong jet stream winds continue to blow across much of the northern tier states. I'll be back with a look at the Red River Valley weekend forecast a little bit later. Tom?
Thanks, Jay. Took both the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland Athletics only five games in their best of seven league championship to advance to the World Series, taking baseball 33 years to isolate the event in the metropolitan area. Not since Brooklyn and New York played in 1956. The Bay Bridge Series begins Saturday night in Oakland, followed by Game 2 played Sunday night before returning to San Francisco for Games 3, 4, and if necessary, Game 5. Should it be played in its entirety, the series will conclude in Oakland with Games 6 and 7. Bit of trivia for you, the last time these two teams played in the World Series was 1913, when the then Philadelphia Athletics beat the New York Giants four games to one. From diamonds to goalposts, you'll see what I mean when Studio One continues. People in the National Guard and Reserve make up over 40% of our nation's combat-ready forces. It's a job that requires them to face some very big challenges. So please, don't make their biggest challenge asking you for time off to do their training. Mr. Aldridge, you uh, got a minute? Be a hero. Give your employees the freedom to protect ours. Every year, thousands of babies die from choking, suffocating, or other breathing emergencies. Just imagine how many of them could be saved if only they came with instructions. Please learn American Red Cross Infant and Child CPR. American Red Cross. We help you help others. It is a lonely job, place kicking, where this week's hero becomes next week's scapegoat. Our first guest knows a range of that recognition, kicking his way from a collegiate All-American to a professional kicker for the Minnesota Vikings, and out of the game all within one year. Pat Beatty is a 1988 NCAA Division II All-American, holding several records at the University of North Dakota. He has since been released by the Vikings and is now back at UND finishing his education. Studio One welcomes Pat Beatty. Pat, good to have you along. Thanks, Tom. How's the leg holding up? Uh, it's going pretty good. I've been kicking once in a while, keeping it in shape. How about your conditioning? How often are you out uh, kicking? Well, since I'm not playing with a team right now, I've just been going out two or three times a week just to kind of keep my rhythm going. And, and I do work out lifting, and I've tried to keep uh, active in other exercises and stuff too. So Now, how does the kicking fit into your future plans? Well, I plan on trying again next year. Um, I'm finishing school here in December, and when that's over, I'm going to go back home and, and just start training. I'll be kicking inside and um, lifting a lot of weights and just trying to get ready for, for hopefully getting into camp next year and, and winning a job. For yourself or any kicker who's been released or cut, who does the monitoring for you to find out what is available? Well, I've had an agent since uh, after my collegiate career, and he, he basically goes out and talks to teams and, and sees if they're interested at all. If they are, they usually come in and look at me, and, and I kick for them, and then he works out the negotiations and stuff and gets me into a camp, and I just hope to do something after that. Pat, go with me back to April during the draft. Were you surprised you weren't drafted? Well, no, not really. You know, coming from a small school, and my name just didn't get out get out as much. And and there were guys in Division One that had great great years. And and I I figured you know very few kickers go anyway. And I figured I wouldn't be one of them. So I wasn't too concerned over that. It's it's actually better to be a free agent as a kicker anyway. And then this series of events go as how they contacted you. Yeah, well, I'd, they had called the week before the draft and just said that, you know, if no one drafted me or, or they didn't or somebody didn't pick me up as a free agent to uh, make sure I talked to them so they had a fair chance at uh, signing me to get me in there. And as it turns out, I didn't have anywhere else to go. And when they called, you know, he just said, well, let's, let's bring you in and get you some experience. And they were happy with Chuck at the time, Chuck Nelson, that is. And uh, so I was happy to go in and get some experience because that will help me for next year. Adjustments from college to professional, did you find them out very fast? Yeah, there's, there is a lot of adjustments that go on. For, like for one, I, <laughs> the extra point line is at the, at the two yard line in that league and here I was, lined up, uh, I was lined up too close to the ball actually the first time I did it and they, they kind of filled me in on that <laughs> one a little too late. But uh, other than that, it's, just, it's a much slower game and there's just a little more pressure and there's a lot more time to sit and think and I, I really don't like that as much. But, because I like, I, during college I like to be real intense and, and stuff the whole game, but there you have to learn how to relax and just and take it easy. And you know when you're not going to be kicking, just to relax, because the game just gets too long. 
Pat, for you personally, some of the bigger surprises about professional football? Just how, you know, how classy it is and how, how well they treat you, I guess, is the biggest thing. And, and just all the media and people around that are, everyone's interested in you. And it, it seems like they're watching every move you do and, and stuff like that. And I was real impressed going on the road with them and stuff. It's, it's kind of a neat experience. You, get, you go from Division Two where we don't have the money to do a lot of the things that they do. And, uh, you know, we're, for instance, just, you know, chartered flights and they pick you up right on, right out on the, on the runway and we had police motorcades everywhere and that stuff's just kind of exciting. About the game itself, pressures, particularly at your position. Uh, one week, as we mentioned before, you're the hero, the next week you're the, the scapegoat. It all boils down to one kick, whether it's a game-winning field goal or just to survive a cut. How do you deal with the mental aspects of the game? Can you master those? Well, yeah, that's that's the thing that that separates the good kickers in the league from the ones that you know are trying to make it. It's everybody's got the same skills, and you're you know the guy that can handle the mental stuff is the one that's going to win out. And you just got to tell yourself that uh, that you know you're only as good as your last kick, and you just got to keep practicing and and don't lose sight of where you're going and and do your best at all times. Pat, walk us through the experience. We'll we'll never get the opportunity. Take us down to the Metrodome. You walk out onto the field, describe into detail what goes on physically and mentally in your mind and, and with the foot as you prepare to, to line up for a field goal. What, what, what do you look after? Well, I, I kind of like to be by myself a lot before I go out and kick, and I do a lot of weird things that uh, superstitions of mine, like tying my shoe before I go out every time, stuff like that. But going out there, I just try to I stay to myself and just concentrate on what I'm trying to do. and. Basically, I don't hear any of the crowd noise. I don't hear anything. I run out and and I take my time and go through the same stuff I've been doing in practice and and just uh, go through and do like I know I can. I mean, I when I go out for a game, I've been kicking all week and I know what I can do. And it's just a matter of going out there and doing doing the things I can do. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this: You you mentioned Chuck Nelson. The, the Vikings have really been moving their kickers this year. Chuck Nelson was released. Teddy Garcia was brought in. He was released. They recently signed uh, Rich Carlos. Mm -hmm. Any personal satisfaction or vengeance seeing these guys uh, released? Well, not really. I mean, well, there's a little. I guess there is a little vengeance. It's you know they keep they're shuffling these guys in when they you know they had somebody that maybe they could have uh, kept around, possibly even on their developmental roster where. I could have developed into what they wanted and stuff and really the reason, biggest reason for cutting me was the fact that they didn't want a rookie kick and then they just wanted somebody with some, some experience and I think you know, like the developmental squad would have been a good place to get that experience and a lot of the media down there have been saying that from what my parents were saying and, but that doesn't really bother me. It, it all really didn't concern me because I still had here to come back to and I had my friends in school to go back to and that, that, that didn't make that that big of a deal. You know, next year it might be a bigger, mm -hmm. bigger deal. Mm -hmm. Pat, we're looking forward to next year. We'll have our sights on next year with you. Thank you very much. Look, thanks for coming on. We appreciate thanks you so. taking the time. Former University of North Dakota and professional place kicker Pat Beatty. More of Studio One right after this break. I was going to take a job with an engineering firm in New York. I got a better offer. I'm building schools overseas with the Peace Corps. The pace is a little slower than New York, but here I'm getting grassroots experience I couldn't get anywhere else. The way I look at it, the world can wait two years for another 40-story smoked glass high-rise. Peace Corps, the toughest job you'll ever love. The best authorities are those who experience the subject. Among those best able to critique and historically comment from a direct experience about the media's performance is Richard Clurman. Today, the former editorial vice president and chairman of Time Life Broadcast offers some media evaluations and solutions as our Open Door segment concludes a two-part visit with Richard Clurman. Let's plunge backwards to date the most single event in your mind that has best showcased the media's strength. Uh, well, the media's strength, if we're talking about the media's power, I think I've mentioned those events. Uh, those events are obviously uh, Vietnam uh, and Watergate. That's media power. Whether they displayed the media at its very, news media at its very best, uh, that's arguable. Um, I would not single out a, uh, one example of where the news media uh, 
was at its best. Um, there are, I think, if you're asking me personally in my uh, lifetime of being in journalism, what events are most memorable, what large events? Well, of course, there's Vietnam, which was a life-changing experience uh, for all of us who deeply participated in it. But I'd have to say also that uh, the quadrennial right of the American election, the American political campaign, is a constant source of, uh, of great interest, although, alas, uh, both the process and the media involvement seems to be uh, cheapening the uh, process more and more. Uh, and I hope both uh, our system of nomination and our system of coverage and uh, what our candidates choose to do will reverse that. But the last campaign uh, for the presidency, although it undoubtedly ended up electing uh, the president the country wanted, was by common consent one of the worst presidential campaigns in modern history. You'd be surprised that some of the smallest events in terms of celebrity uh, have been the most moving in my journalistic career rather than uh, uh, being at Vatican II or flying across the Atlantic with the Pope or, or interviewing this prime minister or that. Uh, there are very moving moments in journalism and memorable where something happens on the street. I mean, one of the worst nights I've ever spent in my life, any place in the world, was in the middle of the Detroit riots in the 60s when uh, the city was aflame and people were being shot by inexperienced National Guardsmen. So it's not just those events that uh, are chapters, chapter headings in history that are memorable. There are a lot of little events as well. I was going to ask you on the contrary that an event that showcased or revealed the media's weakness. Could you single out one of those? Oh, there are many of those. Uh, they happen every day. Uh, I don't mean to uh, beat on this particular subject, but since I wrote a book on it, uh, and there were large events, two fine organizations, uh, one Time and one CBS. I think in the case of CBS, it was a demonstration of how you could uh, make a mistake of unfairness. Now, you know, unfairness, fairness is not required by the Constitution. You don't have to be fair to win a libel suit. You're not required to be fair if, if you're a journalist uh, about public figures. CBS plainly made a very well-researched program that ended up unfair to General Westmoreland. And while he withdrew his suit, there was just no doubt that CBS should have been and was embarrassed for not giving him an opportunity early on to answer this program that so attacked him. Secondly, the Sharon case against Time, both cases won by the media, by the way, because of the extraordinary provisions of the First Amendment. It was an example of how you can get so obsessed with your own rightness that you become arrogant about it and instead of saying, oh, we made a mistake, or if we didn't make a mistake, since Time didn't believe it made a mistake, we can't prove that. And if we can't prove it, we're going to have to withdraw it. Uh, one was an example of unfairness on display, and the other was an example of arrogance on display by two of the leading news organizations in America. Uh, remedies. I want to talk about remedies. And, and one that you propose, Mr. Clearman, making that the news media more accountable and the public more satisfied with the press's performance. What would your advice be? One is the press is the only major institution in the United States, and it happens to be the most major, that doesn't criticize itself. That is, the press criticizes politicians, criticizes business, it reports on government, it reports on sports, on bridge, on theater, on movies. It barely reports on itself. And secondly, and as I say, that's a remedy that's uh, very easy to do. The second one, which is a little more complicated to do, but also not very difficult, is that it can't just be the one-way street it is, the one-way highway that it is, with the press dishing it out. 
They've got to provide another lane on that highway for the people to answer back. And that lane doesn't exist now. Richard Clerman with some thoughts shared in his book Beyond Malice, The Media's Years of Reckoning. We'll talk to Duncan Perry about Eastern Europe's perspective of American higher education when Studio One continues. Yo, Alf here. Apparently some chowderheads out there aren't taking care of this planet. They're messing up public lands. They're littering the beaches and vandalizing the parks. Look, folks, public lands are not like pizzas. You just can't pick up the phone and order more. So let's take care of our land. Let's save the planet. Call me and promise you'll help. I'll send you a bunch of neat stuff. It's my way of saying thanks. It's an acknowledgment of your concern. It's a bribe. Welcome back to Studio One. Our next guest is a leading scholar in European history. During his career, he has mastered over nine languages traveling to such places as Poland, Hungary, and the Soviet Union. Dr. Duncan Perry, Dean of the University of North Dakota Graduate School, has recently returned from, a, from Bulgaria, where he met with Bulgarian educators to discuss aspects of higher education in both countries. Studio One welcomes Dr. Duncan Perry. Good to have you with us. Do I get the impression that you haven't mastered nine by your, your little chuckle? <laughs> Close, but, but not quite. I, I'm functional in six or seven languages, and I can use a few more here and there for various reasons. And you told me you knew Bulgarian not fluently, but fluidly. Fluidly, yes. Fluidly. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good effort. You described to me yesterday that um, students in Bulgaria, the majority of them, could point out on a map where the state of North Dakota is. Indeed. However, the majority of Americans could not point on a map to where the country of Bulgaria is. In a nutshell, if you could give us a little bit of history and background about Bulgaria. Fair enough. Um, Bulgaria is a country of about 10 million people currently, bordered by the Black Sea, European Turkey, Yugoslavia, Romania, um, and uh, has a very long history. It ha is, it's a country with a very reach, uh, rich and uh, deep archaeological history, which is really as yet untapped. Um, settled by people known as Slavs in about the 6th or 7th century. Bulgaria came under Ottoman Turkish administration in the 15th century and remained under Ottoman rule until the 20th century. Uh, for about 500 years, Bulgaria was part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, one way or another. In 1878, Bulgaria received autonomy of a kind under Ottoman administration, and a Bulgarian principality was set up. In 1885, Bulgaria annexed another piece of territory nearby, creating a larger state and some political problems that took a long time to resolve. That, that gives us an idea, at yeah. least, where it's come <coughs> from and, and regarding where it's headed. When you went over, mm -hmm. who were your audiences that you spoke to, and how, how were you received? Well, I was received extremely well. My audiences were largely students and faculty in various universities, and my purpose in being there was to discuss American higher education. What most surprises Bulgarians about higher education in America? I found it very interesting that they felt that our concept of tenure, f uh, job for life, if you will, for faculty members here provided um, there's, there's no illegal behavior, was, was very interesting because uh, tenure has associated with it the, the notion of freedom of speech, so that any faculty member, no, what, no matter what his political views, may say what he has on his mind here. Uh, of course, in Eastern European countries that are under the, uh, uh, the aegis of, of, of Soviet and, uh, well, uh, part of the Warsaw Pact, mm -hmm. typically, um, freedom of speech is not part of the, uh, the package that goes along with being a faculty member. If you exercise that freedom too liberally, you lose your job. So faculty found that very interesting. Um, they also found the idea that uh, students could be let go from universities very interesting because apparently in Bulgaria, uh, once a student is in the university, they're in for the duration and often many of the students seem to be admitted 
as a result of political considerations who their father or mother might be rather than on the substance mm -hmm. of academic merit. Just briefly, because that's sure. about all the time we have, what, is there a lesson in all this? Coming back, and com coming back to America, um, what can we learn about Bulgaria in our abundance and in, within their little realms of resources? Real briefly. What can we learn about Bulgaria? What's the moral of the story in 30 <coughs> seconds? The moral of the story is that we in the U.S. have a pretty good thing, and I don't think we appreciate it well enough. Uh, that isn't to say we can't learn anything from other people. I think in Bulgaria, they value literature and arts far more than we do, and I think our trend in education toward vocational training is a deficit to uh, the future of the U.S. Um, at the same time, uh, when visiting such a country, one comes back with a renewed sense of the great value of American democracy and the freedoms and uh, economic advantages that we have. Mm -hmm. Dr. Duncan Perry, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Too short a time. Indeed. Thanks for stopping. University of North Dakota Dean of Graduate Studies, Dr. Duncan Perry. When we return, we'll take one look, last look at the weekend's forecast. What's wrong, Vince? My woman's done left me, my dog ran away, and people still aren't wearing their safety belts. Ah, oh, Vince, you singing those Buckle Up Blues again? Some people don't wear their seat belts. I can't believe it's true. Those kind of people get knocked right out of their shoes. So buckle up, baby. Don't sing me those Buckle Up Blues. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. I mean it, baby. Buckle, honeysuckle, buckle, yeah. There are people out there who need help, but don't have anyone with the right skills and knowledge to turn to for help with their taxes. You or your organization can be there for someone who needs help. Volunteer your time, and the IRS will volunteer the training to help make someone's taxes less taxing. No fall weekend would be complete without at least a quick rundown of sports beyond the World Series. No changes among college football's top five. All polls agree on Notre Dame at number one, Miami at number two, followed by Colorado, Nebraska, and Michigan. Would you believe this weekend's debut of college hockey across America begins? This weekend series is in the WCHA uh, brings Minnesota Duluth against Denver. Northern Michigan heads east against Bowling Green. And the University of North Dakota fighting Sioux host Alabama Huntsville here Friday and Saturday night. Jay's here for one last look at the weekend's forecast. Jay? Thanks again, Tom. Taking a look at the map for tomorrow afternoon, this cold front, which is down through the central U.S., was the one that was out on the west coast. It's going to move very rapidly with strong northerly winds, or excuse me, westerly winds aloft that will be pushing it down. This is, ahead of this cold front, temperatures will be very warm across parts of southern South Dakota and southern Minnesota with readings in the 80s tomorrow afternoon. And across the northern part of the region, we can expect 60s and 50s over northern Minnesota and 60s and 70s across southern South Dakota and 60s in northern North Dakota. For our region, around 61. Taking a look at the forecast in detail, for tonight we can expect partly cloudy skies, a low of 42 degrees. Winds will be out of the west at 10 to 15 miles per hour, and there is no chance for any precipitation. For tomorrow, partly cloudy skies, a high of 63 degrees. Winds will be west at 5 to 10 miles per hour with no chance for any precipitation again. For Saturday, partly cloudy, a high of 63 to 68, and on Sunday, sun, excuse me, and on Sunday, cooler, a high of 50 to 55 degrees, with a chance of rain. So it's going to be cloudy. The best time for this weekend looks like it's going to be on Saturday. So if you got plans, put it in there. Have a great one, Tom. Thanks, Jay. Have a good weekend. Thanks to Pat Beatty and Dr. Duncan Perry for joining us today. From all of us here at Studio One, it's been a pleasure having you along. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week.